Thank you. Well, I'll take these off, although there will be some points that I will have to use them. Well, first of all, good evening. Good evening. And um, I'm the only thing standing between you and bed. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Not sex, but. <laughs> so um, I'm going to share a few words. That I, and, and the interesting thing, first of all, I don't believe there are any accidents in the, in the universe, any at all. And so um, integration will come up in my comments. Emergence and, and what emergence means will come up in comments. And, and, and this notion of what do we need to bring back into the workplace? Because it is kind of a crazy thing that I find myself doing this work. So I'm going to start with a little bit about my story and then um, talk about how I got to this space of thinking that I wanted to talk about emergence tonight. And then I want to share an email I got this morning. Talk about just amazing uh, synchronicity. Um, because I think it so beautifully pulls together what happens when emergence happens. And so I'm going to start with just telling you that there are two questions I'm asked all the time, and one I wish people would ask, and they never do. And I'm going to tell you the answers. The answers are yes. The answers are I don't know. And the third one is heck yeah, but why the heck should that ever be a deterrent? So the first question is do you miss patient care? And absolutely I do. I practiced OBGYN. For 25 years, I was in. I had the pleasure and the privilege and the honor of being in patients and families and women's lives um, for that that period of time and getting to do that work. Um, the second question is, and the cool thing about the work I do now is I can't go around town anymore. Um, I practiced here in Colorado since. Uh, 1992, and I can't go around town without someone saying, you delivered my baby, you delivered my sister's baby. So it's just this fabulous, wonderful way, and actually it's a great calling card to <laughs> what credibility it gives me in rooms, in business, business rooms and other, other boardrooms. The second question is, how, do you, how does someone go from being um, in um, healthcare that directly for 25 years caring for women and then become the vice president of government and external relations for Kaiser Permanente? And the answer is I don't know. But what I do know is that everything, and this is, this is something that's so important for all of us to remember, that everything that you have done to this point prepares you for what that next thing is going to bring. And it's so, so important. In fact, I remember early on, five years ago, because April was five years that I'd done this job, I keep waiting for them to wake up and realize, I ask, when are they going to realize an OBGYN is doing this work? <laughs> Don't tell them. That's, those are the days where my imposter syndrome is absolutely raging. But I, I nonetheless say, I said, well, what are the transferable skills that you um, bring to this work around that, that, that prepared you for those 25 years? And I said, it's okay, well, think about it. What did your patients want? Well, your patients, you had to have the ability to instantly establish trust. They just assumed you knew what you were doing, so you do have to kind of know what you're doing. You had to have the ability to very quickly uh, form um, a, a connection, that notion of intimacy, and really to be very much present for patients and for families. You had to act out of integrity. You had to do what you said you were going to do. You had to follow up. And probably the most important thing that I learned in 25 years of being, being the, having the privilege of doing that work is that um, no matter what the news was, no matter what the news was, that you weren't going to abandon me, that you were going to be there with them. And it wasn't always good news in obstetrics and gynecology. And then I said, isn't that what your business partners, isn't that what community partners, isn't that what all the people with the now 75,000 miles you have on a three-year-old car, isn't that what they want? And I said, yes. And, and so I was ready, and I walked through the door. Um, and then the last question around this notion of why is it, you know, so, so is it, the last question was, um, is it hard? And I said, heck yeah, it's hard, but why should that ever be a deterrent? And if there's something I do firmly, firmly believe, in addition to the fact that everything we've done to this point prepares us for the next thing, it's that it's rarely, if ever, about you. We do this work in community. We do this work in relationship. And in fact, if you show up on the first day all buttoned up and acting like you got this, somebody's going to call bullshit. So <laughs> you may as well just keep it real, 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 as the kids say. Um, so, so nonetheless, I, I thought about that and I thought, well, what, what could I share? My story, very quickly. I too am 56 and I know I'm in one of these 
recreation cycles of some sort, you know, the seven year itch or Saturn, I learned tonight, Saturn return. <laughs> and so who knows, it, and, I, and I stand on the precipice of whatever's gonna come next and I'm ready for it. It'll be good and I'll just go with it and we'll see what happens. And just trust that there's a net there, you know, that old Zen saying, leap and the net will appear. And so um, my story is I am 56 and I do stand on the giants, on the, story, the shoulders of two giant, sets of giants. The, the, those folks who lifted up the civil rights movement and made it possible for uh, a young black, that's what we were then, girl to realize her dream of becoming a doctor. Because I always wanted to be a doctor except for the little bit of time when I was really little and thought I had to be nurse because I didn't think girls could be doctors, which is the other movement upon whose uh, shoulders I stand. That is the women's movement, and had that opportunity. So there's, there's that part of my story. I've told you a little bit about my work. Um, my life outside of work is about two kids, 27 and 23, and a guy I met at Dartmouth, yeah. <laughs> it's all on the Harvard Dartmouth Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> at Dartmouth, and I graduated from Dartmouth, by the way, the first year they graduated women. So it was a very different college back in 76 when I started college. And my daughter graduated, and I met my husband there, who I've been with since 1979, so some of them do last. There is some staying power. <laughs> And my daughter, our daughter graduated from there in 2009, and I remember when we got the letter, after jumping around the kitchen, she was so excited, I had that moment where I stopped and said, Dartmouth College has been at it long enough to have legacy kids of color. And that's something to celebrate, just, you know, because it can so often feel like change is taking entirely too long. It feels like it moves at a glacial pace but it is happening, it's happening all around us. Um, aside from them, I'm a fiber artist. It's been wonderful to sit in this place and see this work, and that's one of those things you just, I don't know where it all came from. I was one of those folks too, who kids who thought I can't do art, and it's amazing that people actually love my stuff, sometimes buy my stuff, my stuff tours the world, and I, I use paint and I make a mess and I have a, a ton of fun with it. And I also make sure I get physical activity every day. In fact, the lesson for all of us is that whole thing about securing your own oxygen mask before you um, secure your neighbors. We don't do that well as women. And I'm here to tell you, you must do it. You must do it. Take care of yourself. Feed yourself first. And all the ways that mind, body, spirit, which is the Kaiser Permanente brand position, <laughs> says... The whole mind, body, mind, body, spirit thing, do do that work, do do that work for you. So then, you know, with that, just, just by way of a little bit of grounding, I woke up this morning and said, what the heck am I gonna talk about? Oh my gosh, and everybody's gonna show up already, and what are you gonna say? And I started thinking about emerging women, and I thought about the concept of emergence. And so I did a little bit of reading this morning, as all good scientists do, about what does emergence mean. And the fascinating thing about emergence is that it happens when two actually opposite things come together and out of that new things are born. When things that are different come together. And that's, we think about snowflakes, perfect, or you think, or crystals, you think about the, you look at those and they are coming together of these complex um, um, crystal fractals that come together and create these beautiful things, who knew? Or this thing I saw on Wikipedia today, which is called this cathedral, which is this beautiful, I suppose, although somewhat grotesque thing that's made up of millions of termites that come together and create out of this this amazing beauty. And then we think about um, emergence in communities and societies, and you think over the epochs that we've all lived on this earth, where these differences come together, and out of it, amazing things happen. And what then does emerge? <clears throat> what are some of the things that are there, sort of the ability, emergence has the ability to create? It has the ability to surprise, to astound when we look around and see what can happen. It has the ability to actually create all sorts of new things. It has the ability to just create wonder in all of us. And on the other side, it has the ability to destroy, to sadden, and to hurt, and to harm. And it's important that we think about that as women today, because I really, and, and frankly, beyond women, as we think about this notion of the feminine, because it must be lifted up. It is the next emergence. It is the clash, in my mind, especially as a doctor sitting in a room with a bunch of healthcare executives 
who embarrassingly will tell you that the conversations that happen around those tables frequently are the antithesis to health, the absolute antithesis to health. And nobody should actually be surprised when you look at this thing we call a healthcare system that that's in fact what's happening. And so um, when we think about that and think about what, as I've, my journey in this sort of executive space, what, what are the concepts that I try to lift up in that room when I'm sitting with my colleagues who've had the 30 year history of doing that kind of work that I can't. I actually do think about the fact that the doctor's in and it's important for me to bring that healing voice in and make it very, very safe to say, as John Mayer says, what you need to say and also make it safe for others to say what they know they need to say. And it's been a fabulous, fabulous kind of journey over five years that maybe over wine some night or several nights, I can tell you, but it's been, it's taken courage. It's taken, as was spoken about tonight, vulnerability, which is really all about courage. The ability to just say, to ask the question, to say the unspoken thing, to ask folks who's taking care of you, how are you taking care of yourself, to actually say to a leadership team, thinking that us coming together three times a year and working on our leadership and somehow or other we're improving is about as effective as thinking I walk that often and I'm in shape. <laughs> Right? And to say that to a group of leaders and say, we have to sharpen our own saw because not only do 6,000 employees rely on us to do that and depend on us to do that, but at this point, 600,000 members, patients are relying on that. And beyond that, communities across this state and many of the regions in which the states in which we operate are relying on us doing that. So I think that, that those things are important. And the, and the reason why this feminine, and I'm gonna sort of start to tie it up here, this feminine part is so important, is because the world is longing for it. We are hungry for connection. We are hungry for relationship. Um, and you cannot do that in a sound bite. You can't do that from an agenda. You have to have, and you have to create the spaces for people to have those kind of real conversations at every level of organizations. And it's certainly what I see in the 170 or so people that I am responsible to and serve in the parts of the organization I'm responsible to for. And I see it with my leadership team, the, my peers at the leadership level at KP. What are those concepts or what I think are those qualities that we call the feminine that need to be brought in? It is this thing called collaboration or the ability to sit and, and just sit with the tension because it's real and it's real important. It is about connection. It is about creating relationship. It is about saying, I don't know, let's work together and figure it out. It is about getting in folks' faces and very respectfully, but importantly, speaking your truth and speaking your truth to power. And trust me, just because I got vice president after my name don't mean there's not more power over top of me. That on occasion needs power, needs, needs um, to be spoken to. And being able to do that and take those kinds of risks and do it in a way that sometimes feels very girly girl, and I was one of the tomboys too, and sometimes doesn't. And sometimes you do have to channel your inner masculine. And the fascinating thing is it'll be cool to see what emerges back to this concept of emergence, when we now have this clash of, and it is a clash, of the old ways of leading in our communities and in our corporations and around this world. And this new way that if we, women and men who really embrace the notion of fem the feminine, if we take that step and begin to bring it into the world. And so I'm gonna end, and I, got, I may be able to get this little email I got this morning. Um, and I did ask, can I, can I use this tonight? And this person said yes. And I'm going to finish by reading this because it's a fa as I read it and I thought about what we were going to be doing and what was the possible when a whole bunch of folks come together, some of whom know each other, many of whom probably don't. What is possible? What are we creating right here? What can emerge from these sorts of gatherings? What sort of kernels of ideas are already forming in any one of our heads just because of what we've had a chance, in our hearts, we've had a chance to hear tonight? And so what I'm gonna read is from, I don't know if any of you know Jamie Van Leeuwen. Jamie Van Leeuwen, it works for Governor Hickenlooper and is one of his policy guys. He also started Denver's Road Home which was the plan to end homelessness here in Denver. And he has a, a nonprofit called the Global Livingston Institute, and he works in Rwanda 
with a big focus on girls, but really on educating folks. And he just came back from two weeks of a leadership institute he ran. And he writes these beautiful travel logs. So here's Jamie. Two days ago at Intusi, one of the women leading the Bring Back Our Girls campaign from Nigeria told her story at the second annual Women's Leadership Summit. Florence wants to know why the world community can activate vast pools of resources in an international search to find a missing airplane and the tragic disappearance of hundreds of people with families and friends who want them home, but is not as inclined to activate and engage those same resources to find hundreds of missing girls in Nigeria with family and friends who also want them home. And at the end of her very compelling and impassioned talk, the women sitting around the table all reacted differently. Not surprisingly, as we had a most extraordinary delegation of women leaders from this, this year from Uganda, Rwanda, Nigeria, Colombia, and the United States. Some shed tears, some were angry, some were vocal, and others were very quiet and reflective. But here's the deal. When you cut through all of the emotion that filled the room on this very extraordinary morning on Lake Bunyonyi in southern Uganda, there was one common thread that tied us all together, and that was hope. It dominated us. I started to think back on my month here in East Africa teaching an interactive graduate class with students from the University of Colorado Denver and hosting our second women's leadership retreat at Intusi. And with every story, in every interaction, hope seemed to be the common theme this time around. At uh, this time around, we found at every stop, we found when we ventured into the Katanga slums, where the absence of public health is almost as pronounced as the raw sewage that runs through the community. And I ran into a family I've known there for years. The mom invited us into her home. Her two-year-old daughter wanted a balloon animal, and her elderly mom needed some medicine as she was dying of cancer. But what she really wanted me to know is that she just got a job. And in the midst of the chaos in which this family lives, this woman had hope. We found when we traveled north to Lyra and visited with the young, adult, young adults who were former child soldiers, despite the tragedy and despair rooted in their past, many of them are moving on with their lives. One girl is in her senior year of high school, and over lunch, we told her that we were gonna support her to pursue her career in nursing when she graduates. Walter moved back with his mom and is finishing high school in the village where he is originally from. And everywhere in Kampala, despite the poverty and corruption and typical dysfunction of, of the developing world, hope was there as well, albeit subtly. It was, in, it was at Halal's, where my Muslim friend Eddie runs the best local restaurant on the planet. Business is good, and the rice, beans, g-nut sauce, and chapatis are to die for. Based near the slum, you can feast over an amazing meal, an orange Fanta, and get out the door for less than 5,000 shillings, two US dollars. Simon has graduated from college after four years of support from the GLI, that is the Global Living Institute, and has his first job working for an international business. Martina is in her final year of college and is gonna help manage the new campus that we have acquired in Kampala. U.S. Ambassador Delisi is hopeful as he and his wife celebrated a group of young Ugandan fellows at their residence who will spend the summer in the U.S. growing their global networks to build film schools, launch small businesses, and pursue careers in human rights. The Honorable Minister Naserko is hopeful about the public health partnerships we're forming together as she invited us to a ceremony in a rural province where they distributed some of the $400,000 worth of medical supplies that were shipped over in partnership with Project Cure. And by the way, you know Project Cure is Denver-based, is Colorado-based company or nonprofit. And there's even hope for me that I will learn from my mistakes as my iPhone was stolen out of my hands once again as I sat in a cab with my window down in a Kampala traffic jam at night on the way to the airport. There is hope that next time I'll roll up my fucking window like the taxi driver suggested. <laughs> Later that evening, I was reminded over a Skype back home that despite the tragic loss of my iPhone, someone will at least eat better this week from its sale on the black market a potent reminder that my very worst day is many people's best. 
The hope at the reception that the First Lady Rwanda hosted for the Women's Leadership Summit as we arrived in Kigali, Kigali was palpable. A parliamentarian, a deputy chief of staff, a minister, the head of foundation all gathered to greet us. All women. These are powerful women making positive change in a country with one of the largest percentages of women in the parliament in the world. There is hope that my own country can humble itself to learn from Rwanda, where in 2014, there should be more than one woman running for president, just saying. <laughs> the 300 children from the local villages that we hosted at Intusi on the second day of our summit for a basic health clinic arrived with hope that someone would pay attention to them and we delivered. Everyone left with something. More importantly, every child who made their way through the clinic felt important and felt welcome. They had a seat at the table. For many, this was the first time they'd ever been invited anywhere. And so our second annual Women's Leadership Summit concluded yesterday, and as 20 extraordinary women began making their way back to their families and their work in Kampala and Kigali and Colombia and Nigeria and the United States, Africa had changed each of us. It always does, right? So despite the enormity of the challenges that confront us from girls in captivity to the unforgiving conditions of poverty, despite the very different backgrounds and life experiences of each of the women who came together over the past week, Everyone left with something in common. They left with hope. On Lake Bunyoni at the Intusi Retreat Center on June 11th, there was a sense of hope that was so pervasive and so thick that you could almost touch it. And so what I realized in reading that is that's emergence. That's putting disparate people, I mean very privileged, I will, as well as they were students, but also women from the United States with others who came together and out of it, we're able to not only realize the, 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 the incredible power of women coming together and, and creating this notion of leadership, but we're also able to see this emergence of, a, of hope. And if there's anything that I would like to leave us with is for us, and we are privileged. In fact, I said when I walked in the room, usual suspect, Jandell, you're the only black person, and then thank God you came. Yeah. And I didn't know about you. <laughs> yes, sister girl. Hi! <laughs> we have, if we are going to create the kind of revolution that we need to, that our communities are clamoring for and dying for, we have got to make sure our rooms are filled with diverse voices of all kinds, of all walks, so that we have the opportunity to sit there and learn through our differences, get in touch with our common humanity. And I had the opportunity as hearing, hearing all of you speak, to, and I could see and hear and connect to pieces of each of you. I climbed a tree the day that I started my period. I was so pissed off. <laughs> I too grew up with two alcoholic parents. I too, and, and, and was the one who, out of five kids who went to college and said, I'm gonna be the perfect one. Lynn and I have such common stories over, over a lot of years. And as you begin to make these bridges, you'll see you have those opportunities too. I'm being told, wrap it up, B. So I am going to wrap it up by saying thank you all for this opportunity to come speak. We have to continue to create these, these happenstance opportunities to connect because we don't know what will emerge out of it. But I'm absolutely optimistic and positive that good stuff is waiting on the other side. Thank you. Thank you.